Hello everyone and good evening. It's a happy St. Paddy's Day today. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Rob Tardick. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm going to kick off with just a little music and then I'll get into a little few intros and thank yous and then we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of tonight. So hang in there. And again, thanks for sharing your St. Patrick's Day Thursday evening with us here in Law McQuaid Learning Series. Thanks so much.
Whew. Well, all right. Well, I think I covered all the notes tonight. Thanks very much. You've been a great audience. Have a good night. Okay. That's a wrap. Um, all joking aside, um, I don't normally ever play that song to start off an evening at my live concerts. Um, normally, the band dreads that song. <laughs> and when we play that fusion piece, they say Leave, save that till um, the second half once they're warmed up. That is not a show opener. So uh, um, I tried it. So, hey, it had its problems, but <laughs> we, we did a good job. We got through that. Welcome. My name is Rob Tardick. It's wonderful to be here again online. St. Patty's Day, it's... Um, you know, it's so great to see things getting back to normal here and we can um, look forward to getting back out there and playing live music and you'll be able to hear that and see that in the spring and summer. And um, we want to thank, again, a huge shout out here to um, a couple people specifically um, that have helped me so much here tonight and that his name is Matt Durant right behind the camp. You can't see him here, but he's been amazing. He's been helping us, uh, me and my wife, out so much tonight. We had a few little technical errors like Murphy's Law, right? Everything works and then something just doesn't work. We need it. Um, and also Sherry Katz, who's been um, my little uh, champion at Law McQuaid for so long, and I've been doing these clinics for many, many years, and, um, and hopefully we'll get back to these by next year in person as well. But uh, again, these are just wonderful that Law McQuaid's put these on. So a huge thanks to everybody, the staff at Law McQuaid, um, and my friends at Oshawa, where I also teach out of, and for providing me this, uh, some gear tonight. So shout out to uh, Kevin and the guys in Austin and Bill. So thanks very much, and Karen. So here we go. Um, where are we at? Learning your fretboard. Now, the good news is you can all learn your fretboard. Um, the bad news is it's going to be a tremendous amount of hard work. Um, but that's all those good news. The good news is it's going to be a lot of hard work. I think life, when we work hard, uh, you know, things happen. And, um, you know, that's the way we grow as individuals. Um, a quick shout out again before I go on is uh, Guitars. Obviously, Godan Guitars is uh, sponsoring this as well. We got a lot of great giveaways. I know you entered your email at robtardic at lawmcquade.com. So you can, um, you know, um, watch out for some maybe some goodies arriving at your doorstep by entering and being on here tonight. So thanks very much for showing up here tonight. So that's really, really cool. And thanks to, of course, to Diderio, who are, um, you can always see my guitar. My Godan is very easy to see, but they provided some cool essentials, um, instrument cable, uh, cleaning kits and stuff like that. And um, I was using their strings, so I got to, you know, endorse and thank my endorsees who have long time, over 20 years, I think, each of them. And uh, thanks to Larry and Arnold and uh, Bradley. And, of course, uh, Mario, Fred, and Robert, and Simon, all the guys that go down. So huge shout-out um, for them. It's very, very important to me to always uh, show appreciation and gratitude. So here we go. What we're going to do tonight is I'm going to try to divide this up to a few little sections, and uh, we're going to keep it moving. Now, there are going to be a lot of information tonight. I just want to give you a forewarning. There's going to be a lot of information. I might not get to all of it. I'm a, you know, I always, ex um, you know, I, I think there's that saying that I was like, um, if you fail to prepare, prepare to fail. I'm on the other hand. If I, I always exceed when I prepare, so I prepare to exceed. So tonight, I think I've <laughs> totally exceeded preparation way too much. I'm going to try. Um, I apologize for talking fast, but I have a lot of stuff to cover. But the beauty of this, this link will be there forever for you to watch it over and over again. So if you miss something I said or one of the, the handouts come out or the inlays that my wife is so beautifully and painstakingly, thank you, honey, organized this today, um, you can rewatch it and watch it and no worries. That's the beauty of this internet and this uh, live stream going down to a recorded stream. So, okay, let's get into my pedagogy. The way I learn guitar that I have, you know, and I started like all of you, everybody, we started the same. We start by, you know what, I first heard, I think, you know, okay, that was the very first thing I played on guitar, and then later on I just, I discovered that, hey, you know what, you can, oh, I can play it on low string, it sounds even a little closer, you know what I mean, and I, I overdrove my old park amp, that a very dear friend of ours gave us. And I started by recalling, memorizing, and recalling songs. So, but here's not the secret, but I'm going to provide you an approach today. I'm going to do my best to provide you an approach to learning. For guitar players, it's kind of been a wild west a lot of times. You just pick and bits here and there, you know, like everybody, we all got riffs, we only play certain riffs, we don't even know the whole songs. You know, I, I'll advocate as a professor at uh, colleges here and teaching throughout Ontario, doing clinics for so many years, and as an artist myself, I always play my songs at my shows all the way through, so so many students, they just play bits and pieces of songs, so it's rule number one, practice songs all the way through, right? Don't just learn bits and licks and then they're disconnected, because that's enforcing a way of learning as well, where it's, 
like a tangled web. Nothing is connected. So you want to stick to the plan and go all the way through. So I'm going to borrow something from what's called Bloom's Taxonomy. And this is the way I've kind of gauged my pedagogy of learning and teaching for many, many years now. And I've been teaching this at seminars for long quite for years now. And when you walk into a bank, you want a loan, you have a new business. What's the, one of the first things they're going to ask you? Business plan. Do you have a business plan? Okay. And as all of you have other careers, maybe some of your musicians, um, if you have other careers, a business plan is something that you're going to need at some point in your life. It's, it's a framework. It's a fundamental plan that's solid that will show the bank, will show your teacher. You might be doing a project at school. They, well, we want a plan. We want a plan of action. Guitar players, because e, whether you're a hobbyist or a, a growing semi-professional, everybody needs a plan. Now, we call it just a guitar plan, or I call it this approach to learning. Know your fretboard. So know your fretboard is not just knowing the notes. We're going to talk about that in shortcuts, and I'm going to give you a lot of little tidbits and tricks and techniques to help navigate the fretboard easier tonight. So tonight's really about all about you. Um, and I want to you know, make sure that you get the most out of this and, and learn these things and can apply them into your playing immediately, it's like starting tonight. So this, what's this Bloom's taxonomy? Well, my synergy of learning involves a key number of elements. So if we look at the chart, what's happening there, this is the first thing that we all do. That when I, when I, when I start playing Smoke on the Water on one string, I was just luring the fingering, right? Um, I was matching notes with my ears. I was trying to recite and regurgitate um, recognize things that I heard and put them together on the guitar. That's muscle memory. Okay. Now here's the problem, the pandemic of guitar players. That is, there's levels of learning and my, um, we have a lot of handouts going to come on in a sec. The levels of learning will show that muscle memory is the most basic form of understanding. It's not even actually it's understanding it's, it's memorization. So it's the fundamental principle of learning. It's key. It's important. Please go and learn all the songs and do all that. But if you find you're hitting a plateau, you're getting to a gray zone. You, you, you're kind of lost on the fretboard at times. It's because you might lack an approach. You lack a practice schedule. You lack a vision of a guitar business plan. Okay. And that's even if you're a hobbyist, you need an approach to learning or else you're just spinning your wheels and you have a hard time putting everything together. You get little bits and pieces of information, but nothing makes sense. And then add in, YouTube and all the um, digital technology and you're getting videos and hit by videos. You watch one video, next thing you know, oh, a video on, you know, cats playing guitar. Oh, geez, I got to check that out. And then, oh my God, this, this guy's playing guitar. You know, so you get so distraction, right? Remember human beings, we, we have so much distraction. There's so much chaos. Life is chaos in order. We need to balance those. Okay. And order is in fundamentals. Order is in structure and sound foundations. The order of your house, is one thing is the order of your house. It's the foundation that you stand on. That's the most boring part of your house. But you know what? That foundation keeps everything that keeps this office standing. The most important part of this room that I'm in right in is the floor, not my amps, not my guitar, not the mixers. And, you know, other than my wife, of course, she's the most important thing in this room. But um, the floor and the foundation is the most important thing. And the same as your house. And then where's the chaos in your house? Well, everything. It's all the clothes everywhere and you got the kitchen cupboards and, you know, tires stored in the garage. There's chaos. There's stuff all over the place, right? So, you know, we need to have chaos in order to balance each other. They never 100% do, but, you know, that's important. So anyway, let's get on to level number two. So remember, we started with muscle memory. So as soon as you muscle memorize a song, you know, if you memorize a, a chord progression or uh, whatnot, and you go, okay, well, this is going to go to A minor. Right? So you've memorized that chord progression. That's only memory. That's only one, the beginning level of, of, of music literacy, or this, what we call uh, my, synerg uh, my synergy of learning. Number two is understanding. Do we understand what we're playing? And understanding now is just being able to classify, we can discuss, we can describe, like these words say, we can summarize, we can distinguish, identify. So for instance, you've memorized this shape on a guitar. I'll get my hand here. So here, there's like, right? You got a G major, you got a G major chord. You got a bar chord here, right? You've memorized that shape. Okay. Now, what you need to understand though, is it's just like associating the name. Okay. You know, I'm going to tell you, my name's Rob and you've seen my face. Okay. I got my reading glasses on 
And that's all you really know. Obviously, I've mentioned the little things about me. I'm a guitar player and artist, blah, blah, blah. But do you know what like my favorite food is? Do you know what my favorite color is? Do you know what my jean brands are that I'm wearing right now? Or, you know, you don't know nothing about me other than the name and the face. And that's a lot of way chords are. People memorize chords so they know the name and the face. So this is the face and this is the name. It's a G major, but that's it. But that's only muscle memorizing. It's like the parrot syndrome. If you ask a parrot, oh, a parrot just said, Quack, cracker. Okay. Hi, that's great. Here, honey, do you see the parrot said cracker? Um, okay, parrot, spell cracker. What is a cracker? <laughs> what fruit group does it belong to? You're not going to get any answers from. The parrot doesn't understand. It doesn't can give examples. It can't make sense of or summarize or distinguish or anything. So putting yourselves as guitar players, these are the first early steps that have to be going on your brain and your business plan. So to modulate up to next levels. And I'm going to help you obviously talk about this. So let's take a G chord. We talked about the G. There's the face. Maybe a bar chord might look a little bit nicer on the camera. There we go. Nice and symmetrical. We have a G major bar chord. Okay. So the G is the name and that's the face. Now, if I have to understand what the chord is, well, basically we have to discuss the classification. So basically it's what's called to the family of a triad. Okay. So a bar chord or a G major chord is part of the family of triads or three note chords. And that's it. That's the basic understanding. Okay. So there's various types of triads. We have majors and minors and diminished and augmented and major flat five and minor sharp five and diminished triads. And uh, we have a Phrygian triad. We have, um, you know, we have different types of triads, but that's just understanding the group and the family. Now let's move to another higher level of understanding. So now let's move to the next layer. Now we're going to start analyzing. Okay. So here's level three. We've memorized the G major, right? Anyway, actually, no way I understood it because I told you, oh, okay, it's a triad. It comes from the three note chord, triangle, three sided geometric figure. Okay, I'm starting to get with a G chord. Okay, I didn't realize it's three notes in the chord. I always thought a G chord had six notes in it because I play six strings. Well, no, there's actually only three notes in it. Some of the notes are doubled and even tripled. Okay, so. We now we analyze that G chord. So we've understood it now, triad family. Oh, Rob said there's four to seven, eight different types of triads in this family. We haven't got anything specific. We've been pretty generic so far. Now we analyze. Ah, now form identification. We interpret, we work through, we discriminate, we actually distinguish between the notes and the intervals. We're going to be talking about that very shortly. We're going to correlate. We're going to separate the information. You see, so you see where this is going? I need to separate the notes of the G. I need to subdivide the intervals from the root to the fifth, from the root to the third, the root to the octave. How about the fifth to the octave? How about the third to the fifth? How about the third to the root? You see, there's all sorts of different timbres and qualities of sound and intervals to work through and interpret. You can see I'm using all those words. This is analyzation. So again, this is the third level of learning. Now, here's the eureka moment. This applies to everything in your life, actually, by the way. In your careers, you've actually, most of you probably have already done this, but it's time to apply it now to guitar, right? So, and again, I, I can send you these sheets eventually as well. We can organize that. And again, I'm, I am going fast, but again, I got a lot to cover. So muscle memory we started with, boom, what do we do? We get up to um, uh, understanding. Now we just finished analyzing what a triad is. The triad is, uh, let me analyze it. It's the first three notes you borrow take from scale. All chords come from scale. So if you take the, the notes from a major scale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and you borrow the root, the third, and the fifth, that gives you those three discriminatory notes in the analysis um, of the G major triad. See, now we're analyzing. It's got intervals, they're major, they're minor, they're diminished, they're augmented within the chord, not just understanding the triad, but now we're inside it. Oh, it's a G to a B. That's a major third. Oh, it's a G to a D natural. Now we're being very specific to G major, right? We're not identifying any other triad at this point because only this triad will only have a G, B, and a D. And then if I can go up to maybe the major seventh, add an F sharp. So I can make it a major seventh arpeggio or a major seventh sound. You see, now we've been analyzing all the intervals, root, third, fifth, seventh. And again, it would help today for those of you who don't understand intervals. Um, that would be a big thing. I'm going to talk about them briefly coming up after this. And, uh, but again, I won't spend too much time, but that's a key, key vital thing. We'll talk about it in a sec. Okay. So now we have, we've muscle memorized the shape of G major. I did G major seventh. I'll go back to G major. I'm off. Tangent Tardic, that's my name. So then 
we understood that G major is a triad. So it's not just the name and face. We understand this is a triad, and it's, it's the major triad from a family of triads, which are three-note chords. Got it. We now we analyze that triad. It's a root, third, fifth from the major scale. We pull those three notes. Do, re, mi, fa, so. Do, re, mi, fa, so. Do, mi, so. Solfege, right? You take those three notes from the solfege system. Do, mi, so. And that do, mi, so. Do, re, mi, fa, so. Right? Those are those notes. That's if you, you know, sound of music, right? Do, a, dear, going back, right? That's what made solfege famous. That movie. Um, so now, let's move it up a notch. We have to apply this, right? Okay, hey, I, Rob told me, I understand now what a G triad is. I get it, it's a triad, okay, I, I analyze it. I, I think I follow him with his intervals, and don't worry, I'll review the, with those for some who may passed over their heads. But now, let's apply that G major. Oh, okay, well, now how do we apply? We'll look at the words here again. We need to identify patterns. We might need to sight read that G major triad on a page and identify it so we play it. We need to use dynamics. We play it on our guitars. We could I play that on a saxophone, on a piano. On an oboe, any instrument, you can play a G major triad. It'll be fingered and performed technically differently, but it's totally possible, right? So we're applying it. We're observing how this functions in the wild. We're starting to see that by applying this knowledge. So we can say that, okay, well, a G major exists in different keys. That's how you could apply it. A G major exists as the root in the key of G major. Right? I did a little chord progression there. One, two, three, four, three, two, one in the key but G major you know what it, it also occurs in the key of D and it's the four chord in the key of D oh oh okay well, I didn't know that there it is right there I played seven still so there if I can go like this and I'm playing simple bar chords that are maybe easy to see right okay so there oh and you know what though but G also occurs in the key of C as the fifth chord oh really okay well I didn't know that if I even strum it open like You see? So those are some easy cowboy open chords, and I hope most of you know your, you know, your individual open chords. That should be number one on your list when you're memorizing stuff. If we go back to first level, have to memorize your cowboy chords, your college chords, whatever you call them, you know, your C. And again, the focus tonight is not to go over those. I'm hoping all of you know to play those. And if you don't, boom, go that. Research that right away after you listen to that. Make sure you work on your open chords because that will allow you to play chords and songs, you know, um, to a lot of your pop favorite hits and songs throughout history. So now you've seen, we've identified and applied the G major to actually some different scales that appears. And it occurs in more scales than that. It can, it can occur in a minor scale and various keys. And, um, you know, there's all sorts of different positions without getting too complex in theory. Next, let's keep going on. Now, boom, we're evaluating. You've, you've grown to the point now is that, you know, you can decide when and what key you're going to use your G chord and maybe even what voicing you're going to, what inversion, you know, of your G chord. We'll talk about those. You can defend it by understanding where that G chord is and what key, and you can listen to it and evaluate it by others. You'll hear another person playing a triad, a major or a minor, and ear training obviously is a huge part of this as well. And again, that's not the school for tonight, but ear training is mandatorily huge that you always sing what you play, play what you sing, I say. So whenever I play a scale, if you know it's like, okay, I'm always singing and playing. It keeps my pitch, so my pitch can be very accurate when I play. Um, I didn't want my voice, but you get the point. So evaluation is assessing you're watching another video you're watching a concert oh wow that was a g triad that guy rob was talking oh there's a g chord oh that was an inversion oh that was a uh you know um uh oh my god <laughs> non-adjacent sing triad or a spread triad as people call them you know right or right non-adjacent string triads or spread triads um that's a weird word i know i've heard a lot in the guitar community but doesn't quite make sense to me because it's not very discriminate or specific. It's very generic. So I like to use non-adjacent sing triads. So there's a Rob Tardic little tidbit for you. So evaluation, now you can evaluate and see it out in the wild. You can see these triads, you can hear them, you develop ear training, you see, but that's a higher level. That's getting to level five. So we started at, you muscle memorize the name and the shape. Then you understand it. Then you start analyzing the intervals, doing the theory, doing the homework, the intervals. Then you start 
applying it to songs. You're hearing that G chord, not just as the root, but maybe it's the fourth, maybe it's the fifth. Oh, maybe it's the flat sixth and the minor. You know what I mean? So it's got a lot of different places that little chord can pop up to itself, right? And then, boom, you're evaluating, you're, you're, you're watching people, other players, and you know what? Next thing you know, you're creating. You have a higher level of inventing, creating, revising, improvisation, stylistic interpretation is what every, all the masters have, right? Stylistic interpretation means that everything you've heard in your life you now interpret it into your own style. You know, whether, rest in peace, Van Halen, he heard all the influences clapped in the blues guys. He interpreted and mixed it and added his own sound, the famous brown sound. He mixed it, it came out like him. Stevie Ray did the same. Um, you know, Buddy Guy did the same. You know, you can go on and on and on. Joan Schofield had influences. Frank and Ball, Rob Tardicat, Al I don't know, George Benson, you name it, Victor Wooten, so many amazing players all have listened and they stylistically interpret everything they've heard from blues and classical, which obviously preceded rock and stuff. They all came from classical and music before that. And then we had um, the blues, obviously, turn of the century, and then all the ragtime, I should say, and then the blues. And, you know, obviously, I'm not going to get into a discussion of music culture here. But... You get my point. We start creating with all this information at a higher level. Now, just imagine if I took away everything that I just said and you're only left with, I know this chord, I know it's a G and that's it. And I've memorized it. And I just got this C chord and I got a couple shapes. Oh, I've memorized this, I've memorized this. You know, I've memorized a couple of, you know, I memorized a couple. I remember a couple licks. I don't know where, what key they're in or how they work, but they sound cool. You see, you're at the muscle memory phase, so you can see all the other stuff on top above you're missing. It's not making sense. And this would just be compounded as you watch more videos and listen to more music and see more players. So where does that take us back to? You need a business plan. You need a guitar plan. You need to start. The good news as well. The bad news is it's going to take a lot of work. The good news it's going to take a lot, of, a lot of hard work, which is a good thing. Work is good. You know, you feel enthralled after a good workout or you go for a walk or a hike or you have a good meal. You feel good after, you know, so you work hard at your job. You come home, okay, that felt good. So anyway, um, we're going to start now branching off. So that's my synergy of learning. Hope those handouts helped you to encapsulate that information. We're going to get back to fretboard visualization. And uh, here's a little exercise we're going to start with right now. Intervals. It's all about intervals, the DNA, the molecules, the building blocks of music. Intervals are a must learn for every musician. You have to spend the time. It is what it is, you know, or else you will stay in the gray zone and you, and don't get me wrong. I want to say to everybody, do you need to learn all this stuff, this theory? And do you need to be a great sight reader? And do you have mental speed? Because what's really, this is all about, it's about mental speed. Guitar players focus so much on the technical speed, but mental speed is something that you don't even think about, like mental speed. Oh, yeah. You know, you need mental speed. You need a good processor up here to extrapolate and pull this because, my God, there is so much information out there. It's ridiculous. Absolutely. I forget more stuff than I know, you know, and I think a lot of people do that when you get to higher levels of your education. So if we get back now to intervals, visualization, and I got a couple of notes here. So, you know, the, the foundation of intervals and... Um, we don't need to do intervals yet. We're just going to do notes on the fretboard. Okay. Yeah. So, sorry, my dear wife is getting us some slides. We have a notes on the fretboard slide coming up. We got to learn our fretboard, folks. This is the tip, 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 tip of the iceberg. Okay. And this is a must learn. Oh, you can keep that sheet, huh? Just for a sec. I like that sheet. So that's what I kind of just were. Oh, okay. Oh, the logo's blocking my face. Okay. Yeah. One sec. There you go. You can see me and my crazy hair today. All right. So. Thank you, Matt. That's the technology here. So um, you can see that I had there on that little sheet there um, behind, I talked about it, how theory, technique, and creativity. We're, I'm not going to talk too much about that, but that's that synergy of learning. You see, six involves six key strategies. So mental speed is what we're working on in note knowledge right now, part of theory. Okay. So we're going to pull up a fretboard diagram in a second. Um, after, hon, you can throw that one on whenever you're ready. But what we're going to do is while she's doing that, one thing we will need to learn is our fretboard. So an easy way to learn your fretboard is to either climb up like the rungs of a ladder. So eat a darn good breakfast every day. Eddie ate dynamite. Goodbye, Eddie. You need to know your strings. And we need to learn the names of the notes. But we need to learn them like this, like snaps. If it takes you longer than a half a second or a few, you know, 
three tenths of a second, half a second, not even a second, you don't know your fretboard. You need to max that speed out because then you again, the mental speed is too slow. Everything will compound. You will be in the gray fog always because you're just not finding things. You know, you're wondering how your players, you know, everybody says, oh, my guy's so amazing. Come so easy or it's he's he or she's amazing guitar player. He's so smart. You know what? They just work really hard. That's what it is. That's the bottom line. Okay. Uh, you know, I think we're all gifted. We all have our skills. You can all play guitar. The good news is you just have to work your butt off and want it even at a hobbyist level. I know each one of you have your own careers maybe, or maybe there's some young aspiring guitar stars out there. I hope that I can inspire you. Um, you still got to do the same path. You still got to put in the work. Um, and I'm not saying not to practice the muscle memory and the riffs, especially when you're early on. Yeah, you need to learn a lot of riffs and stuff like that. But soon you have to sort through all these pieces, right? Because you got all this, you got a puzzle, but it's all disjointed. You got to start putting that puzzle together and understanding it. The notes is the first step. This is the tip, tip, tip times 10 of the iceberg. So here we have a fretboard. What I want all of you, if you have a guitar in front of you right now, I want you to simply do this. We're going to do this. We're going to, first, I'm going to even turn my guitar over like this. If you can turn your guitar over, all right. Um, hon, ask me any note on the fretboard. I just and take that. I'm going to. I'm going to look away, so I'm not going to look at that. What you want to do is visualization. You should be able to visualize your fretboard without even the guitar, you know, looking at it. You want to learn it that well, like a race car driver. Virtually knows the track. He goes over it ten times in his mind and ten times the days before to prepare for the race. So does the skier. So does the person throwing the three point shot. They're doing it over and over and over to master all the moves, to read the plays. The chess player is like ten, twenty players ahead. Of, you know what I mean? Of the masters are. They're not just looking at the next play or the play in the moment. They already know how the game's going to end before you even make your next move if you're not a pro, right? So um, say, honey, oh, I'm going to say F. Okay, perfect. Thank you. An F. An F is at the first fret on the low E. An F is at the eighth fret on the A string. An F is at the third fret on the D string. An F is at the tenth fret on the G string. An F is at the sixth fret on the B string. And an F is at the first fret and the thirteenth fret on the high E and the low E. Boom. And that's how you have to know it. You have to be able to call the notes out. And I'm not even using my guitar. I visually see the fretboard. It doesn't matter what note she gives me. And then that might be too hard to start with. So first grab your guitars right now. And you can challenge yourself to an exercise that you want to do within a 60 second, like with a metronome, right? So you can, I can just stamp my foot here today. So if I choose a note, I say I'm going to find a, a, you know, a B or whatever, a B on every string. So I'm going to go B, 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 B. I'm going to do ascending and descending, you know, and then, sorry, okay, so I'm going to do ascending and descending, sorry, I was talking there a lot, my volume wasn't up, I apologize for that, if we take another note, we take, a, I don't know, whatever, we take a, a E flat, we go E flat here, E flat there, 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 and what you can do is, again, you can do descending, so E flat is here, E flat is there, 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 boom, 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 you just want to find the notes, why is this important, well, when you're coming to play intervals and scales and arpeggios and chords and you're trying to figure out varying voicings, the masters, the guys who know the fretboard, they know all this stuff. Remember, in the moment when I'm playing and performing live, I don't think of any of this stuff. I've already done my homework. I've done my business plan. I wrote my business plan for guitar 30 years ago, you know, 35 years ago when I started. I don't even know how long I've been playing. So you got to put in the time. There's, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything tonight to learn your fretboard. It's just freaking hard work. That's all it is, you know, and time put into it. But... Again, the good news is you should enjoy it. You love it. It's fun playing guitar and, you know, when you're learning songs and stuff. Now this, putting the fun in fundamentals, <laughs> that's what I have challenged with the students. I always tell students that's the fun, uh, the hard part. How do you put the fun into fundamentals? Well, sometimes you have to, it's like a job. You can be miserable at your job or you can engage your job. Even if you have a starting off and you have a lower position, you can have a bad attitude. It's all attitude. You can have a crappy attitude and go to work and then sucks for you and sucks for everybody else. But you can have a good attitude and say, you know what, I'm, I'm just a stepping stone for me. I'm, I'm smiling. I'm looking at people. I'm pulling out good energy and positivity in the air. You know what? You will grow. Opportunities will abound for you. Okay. So it's all about your attitude and how you take this. If you get frustrated or give up, you know, you got to stick with it, man. Life is a hard journey. I can't give you a secret pill for a guitar. I, I wish I could, or I would have sold it and made bajillions. Trillions. Absolutely. Absolutely. I got handouts for everything. Oh, somebody asked me if there's handouts for anything. Yes, I have handouts I can provide. Um, I can send them to Law McQuaid. They could email them to you or I could, um, you could email me. So I'll, I'll figure that out with Matt. But yes, there's handout like that sheet you're looking at, the neck master. Yeah, I have all that. And notice on that one, you have the natural notes to the left, which is where you start. You start with your natural notes first. I repeat, if you cannot do what I just did, in split seconds, you don't know your fretboard. 
it is what it is. You know what I mean? If you don't, if you can't find notes and you, then how are you going to put a triad together? How are you going to put a scale together to understand major, minor, diminished, Locrian mode, flat six? Oh, a Dory need to highlight the natural sixth. If you can't find the nat if you can't identify the notes, you're never going to find that make this sound Dorian or whatever we're going to get into mode. So again, and don't be freaked out. Don't turn, don't tune out of here. It's all hard work. It's all good. It's all part of the journey. We're all on different parts of the journey. I am learning constantly. And remember, I practice, when you practice, I highly repeat this. These are all real world learning strategies. Practice what you suck at. Do not practice. Practice, if you play your favorite riffs, if you're, if you're playing the riffs of Crazy Train, working on your pedal thing and you got it nailed, you can play like that, you don't have to practice that. Try to put the whole song together, learn all the solo, put it complete. Once you got on, go on, move on to something else. So, and maybe use that as your, don't spend all the time just on songs. I know that's the emotional, you know, I know that's the junk food. People love to work on songs and riffs and everything like, I get it. That's the muscle memory. That's the junk food. But you have to build the understanding, the analysis, the application, the evaluation, and that creativity. You see what I'm getting at? That is a must to get to higher levels of learning. It's just no other ways about it, okay? So we're going to finish off with some visualization um, uh, again, we talked about the notes. So remember, I want you guys all practicing, guys and girls out there, everybody, everybody, however you identify, I want you to practice this um, exercise, okay? Forwards and backwards, you can start going on and find the next octave. Like if I find a G here, if I can find the G here, I can go G here, and then up high, you know what I mean? So two octaves, your neck has it, okay? But first start in the, within the first 12 frets. Start here, within the first 12 frets. So grab a note, I say, okay, I'm gonna find F sharps in every string, I'm gonna F sharp here, I need F sharp here, F sharp there, 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 there. I'm also singing all the time. All the time, you must hum along with your pitches. You need to develop your ears. I need to hear that note in F sharp, I need to know what it sounds like to develop my, I was not blessed with perfect pitch. Right now, a funny story, it's a quick story, in my career of teaching right now, I teach, I'm a professor at some colleges and I'm at Mary, I'm in Long McQuaid, so I'm teaching all, you know, a lot while I'm not performing because I couldn't perform during pandemic, I'm getting back. I've never had so many students with perfect pitch in my career. I think I have like six students right now with perfect pitch. It's amazing. And they're all young and many of them didn't even know they had it. We discovered it kind of together, you know, and it's uh, quite a phenomenal thing. But again, it's still, they still have to learn what the notes and put it all together, that, you know what I mean? So you have to understand and be able to apply and analyze still, even if you're born with it. So. The work still has to be put in, even if you have perfect pitch. I hate to say it, right? It's not going to be the be-all, end-all just because you have perfect pitch. But you can develop really good relative pitch. That's what I use. And you can really work on that by ear training. And again, I'm not going to do ear training exercise tonight. Like, I don't have time for that. But be able to distinguish, you know, like listen to triads. You know, I can hear, a, you know, like a major, minor, diminished, augmented, sus4. You know, uh, maybe uh, like a sus you know, sus two, they're all different, did I make them, did I screw up there, what am I doing? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, all different types of triads, just like this one, you hear this, this is such a cool triad. Anybody out there wanna quickly send me the chat, what triad is this? What triad is that? Such a great song by Randy Bachman. That's one of the triads, you need to be able to hear that sound. You know, when you hear a triad, boom. That's also the same triad in Dire of a Madman. Anyway, I'm gonna gotta watch copyright things here if we're connecting. <laughs> I don't wanna strike anything or I gotta be careful with playing licks. But um, yeah, well that was a root fifth, a root third, flat five. Ah, C major flat five. That's a great, that's the first triad in She's Come Undone. Guess who, Randy Bachman? And then it goes to B major, you know, then it goes to E, e minor. Da, 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 living phone. Right, so anyway. A sus. I, I appreciate you trying. No, that's not correct, but I appreciate you trying. Um, that's not the first chord in that chord. Like I said, actually, the answer is, you can tip, it's going to be a C, in this sense, it's root, major third. E, C, E, flat five, diminished fifth. Dun. Right? And then it goes to just a simple B major, right out of a bar chord, little triad. We're going to talk about those, okay? So anyway, that's intervals. We would really need to um, identify them now visually. So we talk about the notes, how to find those exercises on your notes. You got to start that. So intervals, you need to map out your fretboard and go 
pocket by pocket. If you need to do only one octave like this or here, right, wherever you need to do, and you need to be able to map it out. So let's say fifth fret here. When I look at my fretboard, what we want to be able to do is look at very specifically and generically intervals. Now, but the way I look at it and I approach intervals is being non-specific um, in my playing. Meaning, if I put on, let me just put on a little quick, uh, hang on a sec here, let me just put on. Can you hear that? I hope that backing comes kind of, okay. So I just looped the A major chord, major seven. When I see intervals right away, I'm gonna hit the ninth. I'm gonna go to the major third. I'm gonna go to the major seventh. I'm gonna hit the fifth. Right? I'm gonna play the sixth. Go down an octave. Go to the major seventh again. Go to that major seventh octave. Let's hit a. Let's hit a, um, a fourth. It's kind of sound a little funky, but let's see within the major scale. It's rubbing against the third. It wants to acknowledge itself and go back down to the third, or the fourth wants to go to the fifth. Right? That's all your part of your guide tones. What you have active and inactive tones. Again, we'll. I don't know if we'll get to that today, but anyway, fifth. So what I'm doing is I'll keep that backing track going, but. I need to map out visually. I see the root. I see a fourth. I see that as a flat seventh, which is not going to work, but I see major seventh. So my point is, I map out all the notes. So I could just sit there and jam, and I can do what I call generic intervals. You see, I wasn't calling out specific notes. I wasn't saying, oh, I'm going to play from the A, I'm going to play to the major third, which is the C sharp, or I'm going to play from the A, I'm going to play the G sharp. That's very specific. Don't get me wrong. That's good. But when you're improvising, you don't have time to think of all that. Again, you got to do all the homework at home. Trust me, when we're playing with the band, we're playing shows, I don't think of any of this. I've just practiced this subconsciously for, for decades. And I'm a, you know, a, what's, what's call it? Um, Thung for punishment, I guess. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just love this stuff. You know, I, I, I like the good, the good part and the bad stuff. So we need to map out and name the notes. So we could start in one octave. So instance, here's one thing you can practice right away. We play an A, uh, a scale, okay? You can even do chromatically. I can even go in position so I can go A, okay? I need to know every note, sorry, chromatic, I, within the scale. So we'll play the scale. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. A major scale, which is built of the root, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth notes of a major scale. Okay, so that's being generic. You see, I wasn't specific there. I didn't say we're playing A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G sharp, A. Now, you need to know your notes and your key signatures. That's the whole thing we'll get to after. But B, learn to be generic, I think, when you're trying to improvise to get to higher levels. Because when I'm soloing, I'll say, you know, I'll see the chord and I'll see the G major that came up here. You know what? I want to hit the ninth because I just like that sound. I'm not being specific because you know what? If I change that key to a, a G major seven or an F sharp major seven, I'm just still going to hit the ninth of that particular chord. Okay? So you see the difference? You want to be generic in your understanding and then specific when you need to be. But for the most part, when you're playing, you just need to target cool notes. That's what Larry Carlton would do. That's what the master players who really are so tasteful, they just target a note. So when Larry hears that chord, That's all he might want to do. He just want to express that ninth. He's not thinking it's a B, B, C sharp, B, A, B, G sharp, A. You know, you know, he's not thinking of all the notes. Nobody, it's too fast. You can't, you know, that's, that's not the way it works. That's not musical. You get to learn this sound, right? I love the sound. Keep it simple, nothing fancy. I'm just playing a ninth. And it wants to resolve nice to the third, which is nice, or resolve to the root, which is a nice note. It's very safe, but it's a little boring. Listen to A, listen to the root against an A chord. It gets lost by the rhythm. 
Imagine you had a bass and a kick drum and a keyboard and all the other players, and you're, you're playing, naturally your ear lends itself to the root. You see the problem with that? It's like you go to the store and you ask for vanilla. Uh, they say, you know what, today we got um, vanilla ice cream special for you guys. Say, welcome to Baskin Robbins, vanilla ice creams. You get one free topping. And you tell the guy, oh, I'll take vanilla sauce. And they're going like, what? Vanilla ice cream with vanilla sauce? There's, no, there's nothing complimentary there. But I would say, oh, let me give me a little, you know, a cherry on that. So maybe that's the ninth. That's the ninth. Maybe I want the major seventh. See, there's another flavor against that vanilla root. You see, you start hearing when you start. See, using a backing trap or a looping pedal that I have is very, very important. Did somebody have a question? Okay. Love Shack. I love it. Okay, so, yeah, so the question is, let me just be able to read that for you. It says, is it better to focus on um, all the single notes of the, uh, I can't read it from here, it's too far for me to read the question, unfortunately. Um, is it better to focus on all the notes in a single scale at a time, just remember the locations where the single notes? Okay, well, first we're going back to, yes, both questions are important, but you need to go back to your, the latter post for that question, um, is that you need to first learn your notes on the fretboard. Okay, that's being specific. You need to make those connections. Okay, all right. You need to know where an A is because when you're playing, you know, an A major chord here, you might want to play that A root. But maybe you want to play an inversion and I need that A here. Okay, so you need to know where the A's are because I wanted to maybe form another major seven or maybe I want to play a ninth chord. So I need to know where the ninth is of this A. I know it's a B, so I can't play it in here in the bass, or I could, I guess, but watch if I... See, there I've mapped out every single ninth within that fretboard. So that's what I was getting to. You need to map out your intervals, every one, and you need to just... I need a ninth, boom, I got three options. You see? Okay, that's the way I think of it. Suppose I was on the fifth string, and I needed to map out my notes. Well, suppose, because I had that question one time, somebody said, well, what about this note? Is that a minor second? Well, it is, but that's being specific. That's, it's a minor second from the tonic of G, the C sharp, but it's really, it's a major seventh. I look at that as a major seventh, that C sharp. I don't look at that as a minor second. Yes, it is, if you specifically think of what interval is that, but that's not how we solo. We don't think of specific intervals, okay? So if I look at a triad, root third, fifth, root to a third is a major third. From the third to the fifth is a minor third. But when I'm soloing, I'm not thinking that I gotta play a major third and I'm gonna slide up a minor third to the fifth. No, I just identify the intervals. I, I need to, I can do that, but that's not when you're in the moment when you're trying to create solos. When you're looking for the right juicy notes, just be generic and learn your, map out your fretboard. You just gotta map it out. Within one octave would be a good point, like here. So again, root, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth. I'm always singing when I'm playing, by the way. I want to repeat that, how important to train your ears to hear that. If you're not humming when you're playing guitar, you are missing getting the vocal cords. You're, you're not engaging all your senses. You're not maximizing the learning process. I am sorry. If you're just quiet at home, you're not ear training, I'm not telling you to be a famous singer or nothing like that. You're training. Question. Yes, questions. Yes. Michelle yes, Michelle, thank you. So is the ninth the third, but an octave up? Okay, so um, to answer question, Steve's question easily, no. Um, <laughs> so the ninth is basically we're getting to compound intervals. So I'll explain that quickly. Intervals are simply the distance between any two notes. I interval is between my house and your house. The interval is between me and this microphone. There's an interval, okay? So in music, we have 12 chromatic pitches and each of those pitches has a specific interval and a name. I'm gonna go over them really fast. And I highly recommend, again, you look through this and find other intervals on YouTube. There'll be 10 million on intervals. And again, I will have an interval sheet. Um, if we want to go, actually, you know what? There's an interval sheet. Let's pull that up right now. My wife will show that. And I'll address the circle of fifths question after. Um, we want to, even before we get into the circle of fifths, we just want to look at our own instrument and learn the notes first there, okay? We want to focus on that, okay? Circle of fifths would be a higher level. Okay, 
of learning where you're now you're creating because the chord progressions come from circle of bass. You're thinking about key signatures, flats and sharps. So that can be more compounding and confusing on your instrument. I implore each of you, like I said, do one note per string, six notes in a second. You so you basically go a, 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 that's even faster than one note per second. It should take you no longer than six seconds to find six notes and then ascending, descending. Okay? That's the goal that you have to come. You just got to work that. And every day, one or two minutes. You know, and I'm not saying to practice for hours, but you need a business plan. I need an approach. And what I'm going to do is at the end, I will put up another sheet that I'm going to have here for you, like a practice plan. I created a practice plan for everybody. So you can have an actual a time schedule of what to practice. So we'll give that at the end. Now, there's that interval sheet. Now, is there, I don't know how big people see that on the screen, um, but hopefully you can see that on your screen. And that's intervals. And that is, um, you know, it might look like a complex chart. And again, there's a lot of information here. So again, uh, I don't apologize. There's a lot to learn. <laughs> it is what it is. So, you know, just enjoy what we're doing and have fun. We're just, I'm just trying to help you. And again, um, there's a lot of information to cover. So we can, uh, again, this is where you can find a great teacher. And just to quickly target Steve Jordan's question, you know, no, the, we're getting back to intervals. So Steve, we have simple intervals with our, within one octave. This is an octave on a guitar. So I always use this fifth, right? It's nice, I'm just using this because it's nice and visually here, easy to see on the camera. So there's A to A. That's a perfect eighth. That's an octave. Here's the tonic, and here's the perfect eighth. That's an octave. Somewhere, oh, da, 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 da. right? It's nice to have little familiar phrases you can memorize that personal to you, I guess. So you don't have to memorize that one. Connect something for yourself or an octave because you won't memorize all my old fashioned uh, <laughs> preconceived ear training things. Okay, so here's the second, Steve. A, B of the major scale, right? Then C is the third. D is the perfect fourth, E is the perfect fifth, F sharp is the major sixth, G sharp is the major seventh, and A is the octave. So the second, Steve, is the same as the ninth because remember, there's only seven notes of music. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eighth is the same. So if the ninth, if the second is A to B, if you raise the B up to the next octave, meaning you compound it, it becomes a ninth because two plus seven is nine. So you're always just adding. The third becomes a tenth, which we don't use, in, like in classical maybe. Like tenths are used, but they're usually called the third. A major third is a major third. Whenever, if you hear it in a major chord, you'll see the tenth right here. Like if I isolate those notes, but here. So there it is, there's that tenth interval, but it's just a major third. It oh, okay, Matt's just asking if we can. Yes, that'd be good if we can full screen it. Yeah, so you can see there the pitch in the key of C, and I can very clearly move this to the key of C here. Again, connecting the pitches. So there's C, C to C. C to D flat is what's called part of the supertonic family. Supertonic is meaning um, a note above the tonic. Supertonic. It's which is usually the flat second, as you can see the D flat, or the major second, C to D, okay? Then you can see the names. So there's different classifications. C um, it's very important to know the interval too as well, like how many steps it is. So a C to a D is two frets, a whole step. You see there it says two semitones. The distance is very important. The intervals from C, now it's reading music. So whether you read music or not, that's not the point of discussion. Again, I can provide a handout on my strategies for sight reading, which I don't have time tonight, but I have a distinct sight reading strategy. I give people my five levels of sight reading. So that's another um, uh, program that I offer in my courses. So anyway. Um, we look here, we have the pitch, we have a C, then we have um, the distance of the interval, nothing. C to C is just a, a unison tone. It's like the theme to Rocky, the dot that key, but you can hear D -d 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 that's just a zero unison tone. Okay, and it's open consonants, so you don't have to memorize the sound characteristic, but it's a cool chart, and again, I have all these available. Um, so now, the second is the D. And in the second octave, Steve, to hope that answers your question in a quick way without going, as I want to go on, that's the ninth, okay? In the compound interval, the second becomes the ninth in the second octave. The third becomes the tenth. The fourth, which would be here in F, becomes the eleventh, okay? And then the twelfth, which is the fifth, five plus seven is twelve. Again, when we're playing a G, like, in a, uh, like if I'm playing a minor, and I hit this note, the G, it's a fifth. I don't call it a twelfth, that's not used. It does exist in theory, 
in, in the wild and in, you know, um, like I said, theoretically, but we don't actually use it in practical sense. The only ones, the tension, the compound intervals used, by the way, are the 9th, the 11th, and the 13th. Those are our natural diatonic extensions, okay? Um, and then we have alterations to those. We can have a flat 9 and sharp 9 and flat, flat, blah, blah, blah. So I will talk about that later if we get to it. Um, okay, we're all good for time, hon? Yeah? Oh, okay, perfect. Okay, so that is um, where we are with intervals. So that chart, if you want to get a handle on that, we can, um, or you can look through that chart and name your intervals and learn them in any position. So again, back to the visualization, which we really want to focus on. The last, before I go into a little more on scales and then triads. Um, when you're looking at your scale, be able to identify the notes. So if I take, um, let's take a backing track again. I'll put that backing track on again. So here's the G again. So the A, I should say. Now, I'm going to play an A major scale. There's a simple A major, a little chord. Play some triads, we're coming up to those. So now, just identify the notes when you're at home, like this. Here's the root, the second, the major third, the fourth. Those notes, nice and simple. That's just the major scale. And then jump around. Third, seventh, fifth, third, fourth to third. Octave. So you see, you can do that. Make that fun. Just put on a backing track and sing out the intervals, call them out, and that, and just start with one simple. There's. Oops, sorry about that. Huh. Always that B string, right? The B and G on guitars. Yikes. Nylons. Okay. Moving on to scales, like we just want to extrapolate the scales a little bit. Again, we want to visualize the scales. So what I'm going to show you today is um, just a simple. Well, not simple, but I'm going to show you the, um, the major scale thing, hun, right? It's uh, the six patterns of the major scale. Um, oh, yeah, let's do that one, chromatic scale, perfect, because we can talk about that quickly. We have one that's going to be just, I'm going to take a little Rob Tardic tangent minute, okay? Yeah, yeah, chromatic scale, technique, so let's just do that one quickly. I want to talk about that just quickly. We're going to go into major scales, but this is on, we're on the topic of single note playing. Here's a little quick snapshot I wanted to show you guys for technique, because we talked about theory and technique. There is every single combination that the human finger, four fingers can do. Boom. Done. I've been practicing those for, I don't know how long, many, many years. You heard them when I did. When I'm doing those exercises, those are simply, I'm doing various combinations between my four fingers. So what you can do is, you can use that chart, 24 fingerings, right? Yeah, for instance. So what I'll do is I'll kind of do the slide here. So watch, I'll do the first one, which is just straight. One, two, three, four. Every day, you can do this, pick one a day. It's a 24 day digital pattern X challenge. I have it actually on Instagram, I've done it before. Every day for five minutes, you choose one of those fingerings. And that's it for five minutes, no longer. I don't want you to, you don't practice these for hours. That's your warm up. So today you're going to do it vertically, horizontally, and diagonally. So maybe I'll do one, two, three, four. I'll jump. I'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I'll do three times four is twelve. Three positions of four fingers. So I'm going here. Okay, you can move that diagram. I'll, I'll, I think they get the, the point there. You can always ask me the diagram. So here's the one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And whatever, I can just keep ripping that off. Now, the beauty is we have other 23 patterns. So maybe I want to do tomorrow, I'm going to do one, three, two, four, one, three, two, four, one, three, two, four. Or maybe I'll do it vertically. One, three, two, four, one, three, two, four, one, three, two, four, one, three, two, four, one, three, two, four. 
ascending and descending. One, three, two, four, 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 one, three, two, four. Notice I call things out loud. Again, you get your brain, your mental speed increases. The more you chat, you got to talk to yourself when you're playing guitar. I find you really start picking up the speed, the mental speed, as opposed to just playing in silence all the time. Again, sometimes you have to, but I, you get what I'm saying. Okay, and then you can do that again. I'm just rushing over that quickly. So once a day, there's a new homework exercise for you guys you can do. 24 variations, six, finger, six fingers off the index, six patterns, six off the middle. So maybe on the uh, fifth day, you start with two, three, one, four, two, three, one, four, two, three, one, four. And maybe you do it again, um, you can do diagonal movement. Right, I can move that way. Or maybe I want to do two, three, one, four, two, three, one, four, two, three, one, four, two, three. And one key here, by the way, is the lead finger. If I'm doing two, three, one, four, it's just the fingers, right? And we're not thinking of a specific notes. We're just using a generic pattern. Two, three, one, four from your four fingers. The thumb doesn't count because it's not, it's a, it's an anchoring finger. It's, you know, it's for creating stability. So again, if I'm going two, three, one, four, two, three, one, four, I'm watching the middle finger because all the other fingers, if you have good technique, and that's obviously something you need to work on is creating that stretch in your hand, thumb back, creating like the C kind of shape in your hand. We don't want to bring the thumb up and over for this because you're going to limit your stretch. Like how do you get down over here? Unless you have massive Stevie Ray Vaughan hands or something like that. For the most of us, you want to use more of a classical kind of positioning for this. Okay. So that's another great exercise you can start working on right away to develop your technique so you can get get all those you know quickly biddly bits going on with your um, uh, your alternate picking and stuff like that so next thing you can do is to even make things worse for you we can go uh, we can go like one two three four or whatever or some doing one four two three one four two three watch I can go I can start moving it across four strings so instead of going one four two three I move it across four string groups let's say that I start on the D string and I go to the high E I go one four two three one, four, two, three, one, four, two, three, one, four, two, three. You can use a hybrid style where I grab it with my ring finger, right? Or you can just use a pick. Just use alternate picking. And you can use two different shapes. I can go one, four, two, three, 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 one, four, two, three. You see, you can move your hands in a multitude of different positions. So I got tons of these finger exercises. And um, again, timing doesn't allow me to do them all. But that's a huge one that you can do. Um, 24 note digital pattern challenge, single string. So you're starting off, whatever, sending and descending. Even when I'm descending, I'll still do the same pattern or you can mix them up. But if I'm doing say three, four, one, two, 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 three, I'll just keep doing that pattern wherever and then I'll mix it up. Okay, so hopefully you get that. That's a great one. And again, mix it up. some really crazy sounds and chords which comes out of those all right we talked about scales they come from intervals okay we take the one two three four five six seven eight we build a major scale so we have patterns that come from these now this is part of that muscle memory stuff um, but again and we can show that if we want there's some patterns there my wife will show that again the scope is not into memorize these today or learn them but why you'd want to learn your major scales because it is the parent, it's the foundational scale for so much. Because again, the major scale can be your generic boom um, isolation point in um, going forward um, in your studies. So meaning the major scale is basically, if you look at that first one right there on the bottom, okay, starting with the lower diagram, okay, if I start with that one, the white note is the root. So if I look at that, if I simply play that for you, it's going to be like this. And you can just look at the diagram. You don't necessarily see my hand here. If you have your guitar in your hand, you can try it. So do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, 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 so, do. Okay, so that's an uh, A major scale there in the, if I play in the fifth position. Again, the key doesn't matter. It's getting that fingering down and knowing the notes, the intervals. So when I look at that diagram, you can see, I see the root, I see the second, I see the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, eighth, right? Then the second octave, I see the root, here's the second, the major third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, and the octave, okay? So you can use that kind of those diagrams to identify intervals. You can look at them and say, okay, boom, what's that dot? What's that dot? Oh, that's the seventh. Oh, that's the third. That's the fifth. Load on a little backing track like I did earlier, and you can start learning your major scales. Now, these are important to learn. Why? 
Well, you've heard of these things, the modes, they all come out of them, but there's a specific way that I learn modes and teach. So I don't know if we'll get time to that, but again, I will maybe briefly talk about it. So with the scales, again, you don't want to be just memorizing a bunch of patterns. Okay. We want to understand what's under a finger. So make sure you're understanding what notes under your fingers. So as well as I know the fingering, so like the intervals, the root, second, third, fourth, but like, um, the, the, um, the person was asking earlier, um, as Steve and the other person, you do have to spend the time learning the notes too specifically, obviously, because if you're going to struck the chord in a song in a specific key, you need to know what the major third is or the minor third is the seventh of that particular chord as well. So there's a time to be specific and there's a time to be generic, but with that major scale, we want to be, um, you know, adept at basically all of them really. Okay. So as you can call, so another exercise you can do, you take the scale and you call out the notes. So it's A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G sharp, A, call out the notes as well as you play them. Sing them again. We keep reinforcing that. You want to be able to do that in, in two octaves again. So you look at the A's here, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G sharp, A, B, C. Um, now one thing, I, I stopped there for a second, linear scale playing is it? excellent way to learn because it gets you out of the boxes and the patterns. So you can start on any string. If I start on the A here, watch, you can see if I do a tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone, there's a pattern. That's the whole, whole half, three holes and a half, the major scale. That's the pattern for any major scale, right? In any key, you start from the note, you follow that, you'll end up on a nice major scale. Your do, re, mi, sol, fetch. So practice, my point here is though, practicing scale, very important way to play and improvise. So that's, I highly recommend that because you learn your fretboard very good when you have to look at actually the notes there, you can't memorize the patterns as much, right? If you have to isolate and play, um, a different scale, um, you, you have to be able to visualize the notes on the fretboard. So meaning you're not looking at a, say a pattern when you're on a linear string, it's just like a little keyboard. You're looking at a piano and you're just looking at the notes one dimensionally because guitar is more of a two dimensional instrument. So looking at a scale, play a minor scale like that, I see the intervals that I need to play on and, and plus I hear the sounds, right? So it's all a synergy coming together. So again, and now, um, as I'm running out of time and I'm blabbing too much, I want to touch on triads and a cool exercise that you guys can do with triads. And this is a way to layer triads and the magic of the number five. Okay. One thing, the number five in music is huge. Um, it's a big one, just like the number six is big in music as well. The interval of a, of a sixth splits the octave, right? You hear it in, can't play too many riffs and stuff like that, but you know, the intervals, no, no handout reading right now. Yep. It's all good. Um, when we're, when we're looking at, um, uh, what was I say? Tr triads. Um, I got off topic there. I think I was talking. Yeah. I was talking about triads. Sorry. I, I got off on a tangent there cause I started playing the rough riff and then I said, okay, I'm only going to copyright infringement. Um, we're going back to, um, um, visualizing the fretboard. Uh, I want to start talking, going off into, um, identifying your triads. Okay. So what are triads? Well, triads are, we just talked about it, three note chords. Now this number five can play huge benefits to everybody from now from a hobbyist to a pro. I've used this in my ensemble and we're going to, I know I'll do a little, let me just do a quick loop again. Let me just cancel that loop out. Okay, I'll do a different, I'll play a simpler chord this time so you can realize, let me just play a G major this time. So I'm going to one, two, three, four. Okay. So there's my loop. Okay. So triads allow you to See, so I can actually play solos and melodically through my knowing my triads. Okay. Now I'm not talking about, I'm not talking here about, whoops, oh, quickly, quiet. I'm not talking about bar chords and caged. Okay. The cage system is that big system of chords. You probably heard the acronym C shape. We don't need the handout. Don't worry about that. A shape, G shape, E shape, and D. Okay. The cage system are triads, but it's kind of a big blocky thing to memorize a lot of times. It's better to, in the long run, use triad shapes, smaller shapes and learn them all over the fretboard. Okay. Because they allow you much more opportunities for playing as a guitarist. 
Um, these big blocky chords, which we start off, don't get me wrong, cage is important what I'm saying. It's like you want to take the cage up a level and we want to um, now isolate all the triads. And there's six little cool little triad shapes I'll show you um, coming up soon. And uh, Hun will be doing like, a, I think it's like still got the blues. It's a triad, but we don't need it yet. So I'll have that ready, but as long as you can see where it is. We're no, we don't need any handouts on the screen right now. So for the triads, this power of five is huge. So here's a little, a, a little, little cool little harmonization, little trick you can do with triads. So you have a root third fifth, and you have your basic break down this G chord. We have a G major here. Oops, I think. Hang on, sorry. Sorry, I was just tuning my. Yes. Yes, linear would be great. That's what I'm saying with intervals. Yep, I was gonna, I think I was gonna demonstrate that. The oh, the question was, I apologize. The question was, is learning your intervals on one string probably a better way than learning them in a box shape? Yeah, it is better because it's easier to visualize for the student, again, linearly, like a piano. Like piano players have an easy time. You can see the major second, you can see the minor third because they're right side by side on a guitar. You know, like, you, like I said, when Steve was asking about the ninth, here's the second, but here's a second. Here's a second. You know, there's a lot of seconds around that I can play. You know what I mean? So it's like I can play an open string here. I can play this as a second. You know what I mean? Or the ninth. So it's that takes a little more practice and really work on your fretboard. But again, just string by string, up and down like a ladder. You know, you can just climb up and down the strings of a ladder. Maybe d develop like a halfway point on the fretboard. You recognize that this is A, D, G, C, uh, E, and A. You know what I mean? You can memorize the notes there at the halfway point. That gives you, oh, that's A, oh, that's B, then, oh, that's G. Um, but yes, to answer your question, yes, learning notes on one string can be a big help. Again, absolutely, because you don't formulate patterns. You don't have to cross strings because it's, it's complicated. The guitar is laid out. Um, not an easy way. Guitar is a very different, difficult instrument to visualize and navigate. Absolutely one of the most challenging instruments to navigate and visualize, 100%. Very difficult. So mapping, that's what I was talking earlier, visualization, mapping out your intervals ahead of time, putting on a backing track, slowly going through the notes, mapping out quadrant by quadrant, zone by zone, inversion by inversion. You know, you got to spend the time. You just got to put in the hours. But eventually it all connects though. There's a lot of, you know, you get those eureka light bulb moments again with the intervals. Okay. So the triads, it's good to know them in quadrants, like I said, zones. And that's one way you can play. Like I usually give an example. I have like still got the blues. I get my students. We don't need yet, huh? Or I'll do like Hotel California. We'll take little simple progressions. And I'll tell my students, because, you know, you'll hear a lot of people starting to play the beginning. I can't play too much Hotel. I don't want to get like, but you hear like. You know, they'll start strumming the first two chords, B minor to F sharp. Well. That's all fine and dandy, but if there's two guitar players, we want to harmonize with each other. We want to play off each other. The worst thing to see is two guitar players both playing the same thing, and that's very common. We've all been guilty of it. We're playing with a double guitar duo, and you're both playing the same rhythm. You want to stop that. Now, how do you stop that? Well, you got to know your fretboard. You've got to work on it, okay? It's not going to happen magically. But triads are the answer to that. And the number five is a great little hack, a little trick, a little secret harmonization tool you can do. What does this number five mean in triads? Well. All you do is you play up a fifth. If, 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 you know, Matt's at home, we're jamming on guitar and he's playing me a G chord. You know what Rob's going to play? Here's this, eh? I'm going to play this. I'm playing a D major. Yeah, sure. You see how nice that sounds over here? I'm playing a D major. I'm not playing a G major. Here's a G major together. We cancel each other out. Totally boring. Now I can play some triads. They'll sound okay. They'll sound nice. That's part of learning. Learning all your triads in quadrants, right? So I learn the first zone here. Then I go up to this play here. Root, third, fifth. Then an inversion, third, fifth, root. Then I'll learn here and go, and then here, say I'm playing the third, the fifth to the root intervals, then from the fifth through third, and then over here, the G. So there I'm getting, I'm playing from the, the fifth root third, and then root third fifth. Okay. 
the watch, the number five. If I layer a D major chord, even the open D, like this. Right volume. Sounds nice. Nice way to harmonize together. Now let's try some other voicings though. Move it up a little higher. I'm using a different system. <laughs> um, okay, so hopefully you heard that. Hopefully you heard that, how magical that sounds. And all we're doing by playing, um, when we layer a fifth, an interval on top, we're getting sounds. We're getting a major ninth. The one thing we created where, Steve, again, I'm going to keep introducing that ninth note, we added the ninth of the scale. So when I play a G chord, somebody's strumming a G in your band, and you come along and say, this guy Rob told me to play a D on top of that. Right? If you're having two guitar players at times, and you don't want to overdo this technique, but it's a nice way to provide some contrast and harmony. Well, the D is still part of the G. That's the try. That's the fifth. Because root, third, fifth of G. You gotta know your intervals and notes. So there's a D, right? So that's the root. But look, as I play, if I play the major third of the D, well, that's just the major seventh. And then look, I'm playing the A as well. So it gets a beautiful, really like nice major nine sound, major seven, major nine, by combining them. So we have two nice notes. The seventh and the ninth are, are brought out within the D major triad. So it's just like a little chord synonym, like you're stacking triads. It's a really, really cool thing. So that's the power of five. Now, we could do the same thing with, lo and behold, a minor. I could do the same thing on a minor chord. So let me just cancel this loop out. Let me do a G minor chord and do the same, same thing. Missed the loop a little bit there, but anyway. So I'm gonna play a D minor, like this. See, there's a simple D minor shape against G minor. six triads on the top three strings. One, two, three, then back to four on the top, five, and six. Beautiful. Okay, so that's again stacking. Now, of course, over the G minor, I could have played a G minor triad, of course, at times, and that might be nice. I could have done that in that example. Switch from G to D. That's something nice to do. Switch from a G minor triad, maybe. Work on like... You see? Notice I'm focusing on the top three, top four strings of the guitar. Another huge takeaway, focus on the top three, top four strings of your guitar. Learn the notes there. Crucial. I know we all start with the notes in the bass. Very important. That's where all the power chords and your bar chord roots. Very important. But a lot of the magic on the instrument happens on the top four. A lot of them, when you hear jazz and stuff like that, I'm playing like... Right? So, I'm going to remember. Yep. Say, say that again. So, the question is, would... You could, you can stack different, you can, like, now when you're saying a fourth triad, that would mean, um, to my ears, by interval, um, Steve, if you're playing a G, that means I would play a C on top of it. Now, um, it's okay, but the fifth is going to sound sweeter. You can stack, by the way, you can stack tons of triads against the G major, not just the G. So that's another thing. Thank you, Steve, for that. I could do other triads on this, you know what I mean? So if I go back to that chord, watch. Oh minor so if I do like I said the D minor sounds nice that's the fifth chord right G A B C D just five right so for four it'd be 
G, A, B, C minor. Now C minor, the problem where it would, well, we get a minor 11th sound because the C natural was is the fourth or the 11th of G. Not bad, because it's a minor third, it's a whole step. The minor third is a whole step from the 11th or the fourth. That's not as much tension. If it was a major and you had the 11th or the fourth, that would be tension. But it's a semitone, we don't want that. But here, see even now I'm soloing. If I'm soloing from the fourth, say nice. You see there, I'm actually going on the G minor. I'm playing the actual fourth, which is the C. Right now, but to play the actual C triad, well, you know what? Let's just try it. <laughs> See, a little funky, isn't it? Right? So that's not a good choice. Now, why? Well, the fourth is rubbing. And then here, look. There's a big problem right there. Boom. The sharp five or the minor six. You're getting a huge clash right here. Right? So the fourth is not. So I don't know if you meant that, but again, I would avoid the fourth chord minor to stack on top of a minor. Okay? So you don't want to do that because as you play that um, C minor, you have a C, E flat, G. The G is cool. The G is the fifth. The C is the 11th. Like I said, that's not sound too bad. If I just play the 11th and the root or the fifth and the root, that sounds okay. But the problem happens when I play the E flat, right? That's the problem though, okay? So that rubs the wrong way, okay? But what would be better is the third. Third, um, the third over a major. Okay, Oops, stop loop. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm in my slippies. Um, so to recap, the, I would stick just today without getting too off topic for most beginners and meanest, layer the number five, but you could layer other nice ones are like I said, the, in a nutshell, over a major chord, a fifth higher is really nice. Over a minor chord, a fifth higher is nice. Over a dominant chord, a minor seventh is very nice as well. Up a fifth. These are all fives. Um, but over a major chord, you know, you could do a minor, a, a third higher. That would sound nice. So over G major, a B minor would sound really, really nice as well. That's a very common um, triad to do that. So I could show you that quickly. If I layer this, let me loop that memory. There we go. So I'll play G major again. One, two, three, four, and... So now, over the G major chord, I'll put a B minor. You see, and I use that for my improvisations, you see? I'm using that idea, the B minor, as part of my improv. You see, I'm playing a B minor triad. Root, the minor third and fifth. Against G major again. Okay, so again, hope you're getting that. That's a really cool thing you guys can start doing right away in your playing very easily. Add the power of five, work on your triads again, majors, minors. Um, diminished and augmented, okay, those are part of what's called the tertian harmonies. Music is what's called tertian based, meaning it's built of stacked thirds. So, for instance, um, I know there is a hand out there somewhere that shows, but it's getting to sight reading, so I'm not going to show that one. But if we stack thirds, so if it's probably sometimes I'll just simpler to show, um, we play A major again. So I play A to C sharp to E. Now there's two thirds there A to C sharp. That's a major third. Like Van Halen uses that in those, uh, some of his songs. He loves those riffs. That's the major third intervals, right? So the major third is a great interval. If we use the minor third on top of it, see, that has the fifth on the top. So we have A, C sharp, E, one, three, five. So there's the major triad, right? So that's our major um, uh, triad. So if we do the minor triad, do a lowered third. That's how we get that sound. Now, if we want diminished, we have to lower the fifth. So the E becomes E flat. All right. And again, 
as the one question says, playing these on one string, a lot of them is a great way. You could do an exercise like tapping. I should get, I, um, I switch over to my um, electric guitar. I could probably, um, I might show this on my electric guitar. Yeah, well, we can go a little longer though. Oh no, it says, yeah, yeah. So if I show, go ahead, Matt, you had, um, yeah, yeah, we're good. So I might switch to electric, I was just gonna say. But anyway, if I'm gonna show it on one string, so if I show A, there, so there's my E, there's A, C sharp E. So a tapping is a good way to actually learn your triads because you can hear the sound linear on one string. So you A, C sharp E, so t learn to your triads by making it fun for yourself. An approach is tap your triads. Minor, I lowered the third. I went from the C sharp to the C natural. So here, right? If I wanna make it diminished, I will lower the fifth as well. See, kind of cool. So I have major, minor, diminished, major flat five. She's come undone. Ba -da -da -ba. There's that major flat five sound. How about a uh, augmented? Well, we go go back to the the root, the third and the fifth major. See, I raise it to E sharp, the sharp fifth. It's an F natural and enharmonic, meaning the sharp of one can be the flat of another. But in terminology, if you're writing it down, it should be noted as an E sharp because it's the sharp and fifth. That's just nomenclature, like the term, terminature. Um, nomenclature, whatever, is that the word I'm right? Right, yeah. Now, there's one sus two. How about this one? We can play the second and the fifth. Sounds very Van Halen-y. Van Halen loved his sus fours and his sus, um, sus two, sus fours. How about sus four? Which is one, four, five. One, two, five. You have a Phrygian one, two. You can go like this one. You can have a Locrian. That's a hard stretch. <laughs> That's all the way to the sharp fourth. So you have, you have Lydian. Did I say Locrian? I'm sorry. Lydian. You have a Lydian triads. You have um, a Phrygian triad. One flat two, uh, five. One sharp four, five. Um, again, what am I actually, quick thing, what I'm talking about here. You see, these are the generic formulas. You see, I didn't talk about any notes. I could do this on any string, and you should practice on any string. You don't need to, like, you don't need to, I'm gonna rephrase that. You need to learn the notes, but also the recipes you need to know, right? The ingredients. If once you learn the recipe to something, then you can mutate it and make it into all sorts of different variations. You can take a pizza, you can take, you got the basic ingredients to make pizza, the dough, the flour, the yeast, the tomato sauce, but then you can add pineapple to it if you want. No, I wanted meat to it. No, you wanted veggies. No, you wanted some prosciutto. No, you wanted some provolone cheese. You know, you can mix it up with all sorts of different ingredients. It's still a pizza if you're classifying. Oh, it's a pizza. Well, but now we're specifically, right, what type of pizza is it? Now we got to analyze the ingredients, what we've actually done, right? So with triads, it's good to learn them again, that linearly like that, maybe tap them out. And if you can't tap, you don't have to do that. You can just simply go like, slide them like that, but then work them into small little groups and quadrants, okay? Which are kind of what we call their inversion quadrants. You hear that word inversion. What is an inversion of a triad simply mean? It just means the notes in the bass are not always the root note, right? A lot of times when you're playing, the root note is not always the most interesting note. Like if I play these. So those are some what we call non-adjacent triads. They're just inversions of triads. I just like, or spread triads. I know people, I heard um, uh, Rick Beato Austin mentions, a lot of guys mentioned spread triads, which is kind of very generic thing to say. It doesn't quite tell people what does that mean. You know what I mean? When you're hearing. Eric Johnson uses a lot of quote spread triads or inversions of triads, right? Where he's playing a C major, but he'll voice it minor, D minor. Right? He's spreading out the triads in, an, in their way. So you could put the third in the bass, or the fifth, oh, third, and the tonic. Minor, sus. Right? So you can spread them out like that, mute them. Okay? So these are all, and I'm getting a little bit carried away here, but on all the ways you can play triads. But again, learning the formulas, the families. One, three, five major, one flat, three, five, one flat, three, flat, five diminished, one, three, sharp, five augmented. Again, you don't have to memorize all these today. It's here. You can memorize it yourself at time. Take everything slowly. I know there's a ton of information. We're already at 930. And I have any, what's that?
Oh yeah, so so the triads would would be kind of the same as one for fives and twelve bar blues, circle of fifths. Yeah, absolutely. So absolutely, the um, we can talk about the cycle of fifths. We can bring that up. Cycle of fifths is a critical thing. We can bring that poster up right now, so you don't need to see my face, or you can see the cycle. Cycle of fifth is a huge part of understanding harmony and chord progressions. Pop music is built of four chord progressions, either. One six four five one four five six one six four five one four three one six three five. You know, there's four chords in most pop music. Okay, traditional music. If you look back, listen to the Beatles and uh, you know, the, so many bands. They use chord progressions that had a little more substance to them. A lot of times, there was a lot more variety and and and, and merit. You know, not merit, but just girth. They had wider, expansive. You know, they pulled from a lot of the secondary dominance, and there was a lot of way chords were really moving and shaking around. Um, but History note, where did the circle of fifths come from? Well, before it was created, it came from tetrachords. What are tetrachords? Well, they're four note scales, four note partial chords. Where did those all come from? I don't know who, if you know, the person responsible for all this talk I'm talking about today was a man named Pythagoras um, from the Greeks. So um, everything we're talking about, I got to do a little homage. We, we you know, we, we <laughs> what's the thing from Wayne's World? We're not, we're not worthy. You know, he was a brilliant um, these were brilliant mathematicians. Same thing was Benedict. Uh, there was a, a Benedictine monk, um, Guido uh, di Rezzo, Guido di Rezzo, from 1000 A.D. He's the one who had the origins of the staff, not tabs. Tabs have been around even longer than notated music, actually. Um, you know, we're going back to like the pentatonic scale, one of the most oldest scales, even before pentatonic is the oldest scale. We'll talk. We'll finish off maybe a few minutes pentatonic before I wrap up. Um, but going back to the circle of fifths. That was named actually the Pythagorean scale. That's the actual name of the actual <laughs> circle of fifths, the Pythagorean scale. Um, about 600, uh, late 500, 600 BC, he basically divided the octave into the 12 steps you see there. C at the top, and then if you go fifths, what it means that every progressive letter in the clockwise direction is a five apart, like we talked about. When you layer play a C chord, what chord are you gonna layer on top of a C? A G, right? If you play a G chord, what are you going to stagger on top? What was I doing? D, right? You see the pattern? C, G, D, A, E. Now, if you go all the way around, you follow all those 12 major keys, plus the three enharmonic keys, by the way. So there's actually um, 15 plus 15 major, 15 minor. There's 30 keys in music, okay? So we have uh, 15 major keys and 15 minor keys because you have three keys on the bottom. The only thing that chart's missing is C flat, where the B is, should be also a C flat enharmonically. Okay, and then the G sharp should also be A flat um, minor as well. Um, there's the A flat minor scale as well in G sharp. So anyway, I'm not going to get too carried away and harmonic keys get confusing. But that's where chord progressions come from. If we look at the blues, people are talking about the blues. Well, the blues has been around theoretically the harmonic structure, the gravitational forces of the blues and jazz, the 251, which are the two key founding chord progressions in history, um, they're on that Pythagorean thing. So Pythagoras was already well ahead of this, except he wasn't playing blues and, you know, he was playing monk, monk tunes and stuff. So, but he was aware of the mathematical relationships between these. And um, so we had this, and uh, oh, I don't know if people can see that 12 bar blues. Yeah, not not yet, not yet. I have a do I do have a little twelve bar blues um, chart to come up, but first let's continue. So we see that. So we have a C chord, which is the one. The four chord would be the F, and the five chord would be the G. You notice they're the closest together because they have the greatest gravitational pull. In within the circle of the wheel, there the chords that are the closest have the strongest pull to one another. The chords that are the farthest apart, like the C going all the way to like the G flat or the G to the D flat, they have the they're six. They split the octave, the tritone, six frets, tritone, six frets. That's the um, that's a very important interval in music. It splits the octave in half. It's like the center of the musical universe. So you get all sorts of um, tension and release. It's all about you know. Um, chaos and order we talked about, it's really just tension and release. You have tonic stability and you have tension in music and you're constantly playing off those two things with say dominant harmony and major harmony. So if you look at the C chord, G is the dominant, it's the G chord. It always wants to resolve back to like final. So you play simply or you do F is like the amen. Right? So F is the amen cadence, or called the plagal cadence, for, and then the perfect cadence, what's it called, is G to C. Okay? 
Again, there's all sorts of cadences, which are just gravitational resolutions between chords. That's what they mean. So you see, if you look at that pi diagram, remember any, any chord that you look at any chord on that chart, remember the one chord going clockwise is the five, or you go counterclockwise is the four. So there's your one, four, five in chord progressions in every single key. So if, you know, um, if I'm going to go, just let me grab, I'm going to switch guitars just quickly. Speaker, but hey, you can deal with it. <laughs> yes. Yes, let me do a wardrobe wardrobe change for you just quickly. Kind of we're sitting off here. <laughs> I'm just gonna plug in. I'm meaning to promote another one of my beautiful. Should be good. Okay, hopefully you can hear that okay. Um, that's my Godan passion. Thanks to the guys at Godan for sponsoring us. And of course, I'm always using, on these ones I use the New York XLs, 10 to 46, but I also use um, 9 to 46 at times, which is kind of like, um, like a, a little blend, which is like a little blend. So these are great. Um, the New York XLs are great strings from Dodero. Check them out. Um, a little more money, but they're worth it. I find they intonate really well. They just, the tone is a little more, I don't want to say ferocious, but it's just really nice balanced tone, but a little more grit and, uh, ferocity, if there's two, such a word. Um, 9 to 42 on my tellies. I don't have, you know, I didn't bring all my guitars here, but, um, 9 to 42 on some guitars, 9 to 46 and 10 to 46. So I use those three brands. And then I use the Pro Artes. People are wondering, I use those on my nylon string guitars, which are great. Uh, extended play strings they're coated they're a silver um plated wound string like a clear nylon string so and then oh yeah and then i use the nickel bronze for my acoustic strings and uh yeah and sometimes the newer the coated ones so the extended play so those are all great thanks to Dario for the cleaning supplies as we wrap it up here tonight i'm just kind of going to finish off with this whole thing about the blues and improvising <laughs> and i'm going to give you a couple little techniques for the pentatonic scale to think about the number five again we're going to do the number five and we'll wrap and we'll finish off that off. And um, I wish I had time to get into modes and all that other fancy stuff, but we will not. Uh, did you have a, a, oh no, keep the, let's keep the cycle, the wheel for a second. So we see that wheel. You can see, I hope you can see the wheel that we have the one, four, five progression. We have on every single note you can. So if I go into say E there and I start jamming on an E chord, Right, so I'm just wailing, wanking on an E. Then the A would be the fourth. E, F, G, A. Back to the one, the E. Then, then I'm gonna go to the B. Notice the B is right beside it on the pizza. I go back to the A. Back to the E, which is an E7 sharp nine. You could play it. E major. I could play these all minor, so again, we're not gonna get excuse me, a little too carried away with all the harmonic options, but the point is the circle of fifths has all the chord progressions in there, okay? If I'm playing like a pop song, I was like a student, it was like, a little simple weekend song I was learning for somebody. It's just basically you're playing the root, the C, to the sixth chord, to the A on the diagram, to the E, and then to the G. You see, pop music loves to follow the cycle of fifths, okay, where jazz will tend to follow, um, it likes to go the other way around. It likes to go in fourths. It likes to try out either modulating whole steps or down in fourths. So again, I don't have the, all the specifics to get into all the harmony of jazz, but that's a very little cool um, wheel. Highly important to memorize that wheel. You need to know where every chord is how it sits, just play chords through the wheel, ascending and descending, you know, maybe using your triads. Okay, so there's so much to do at the end of today. And again, I apologize if you're overloaded with information. But if anything, it should inspire you to go, wow, there's a lot to work on. Just chip away at it, bits and pieces. And the last thing lets that power of five, because if we're playing the blues, and now, honey, if you want to put that 12-bar blues little um, uh, sheet, that's just mine. This is going to be my own handwritten um, sloppy, sloppy, slop. So... Okay, so we're going to have that. Yep, okay, so she's going to put on a 12-bar blues. It's just, I'm there just to show you 
the form of it. You can take a look at it, but really I want to show you that power of five because what I'll do is I'll create a loop here. I'm just going to create a loop on the one chord. So watch what I'll do here. So I'm just going to go and jam like this. Um, okay, so I got a nice little. So I'm playing an A minor. Now, I'm going to do that again. Sorry about that. I played that a little bit loud. I'm going to do that loop. So it's a little quieter. There. You can hear that. So here's the A minor pentatonic scale. Now you might not know this pattern, but again, I'm just using the power of five for some players who are a little more advanced, who are maybe know their pentatonic scale. So you could play this, this straight scale. Right, you can play the scale. But that's very boring. Quick way to do it is just play E minor pentatonic over it. You see how the notes kind of shoot out to you a lot more? Okay, so. We can take away the 12 bar blues pattern hunting on. We can take that off. So people saw the form of the 12 bar blues there. One chord for four bars, four chord for two bars, back to one, five, four. So again, not the scope of today, but you'll have that sheet there on the screen. You can see it. So watch again. Watch how the notes of E minor pentatonic, even if I played in a really rudimentary position. See, it really rings out a lot more because you're hitting a lot more specific intervals that are more tasty. It's again that vanilla ice cream, putting a little more sprinkles on it. Where the A, especially if you land on the A, it's very boring because there's already an A in the bass. Again, map out your intervals. So maybe play the fifth or maybe the ninth. Fourth. See, over the pentatonic. The ninth sounds great. Yeah, that sounds really good. Or the A bend up. Right? That's a nice sound. But again, going back to E. Okay, so what we can do is use that groove. Put on a progression, use the power of five. That's how I want to kind of end off tonight without going on too much. Try to keep it really simple for the most part um, in terms of theory, it can get really complicated, but again, just take it in bite-sized chunks. And again, this is pretty much an introductory lesson for the most part. Um, but the power of five stuff is really cool um, in terms of your um, um, improvisations. So remember that over an A minor pentatonic, what can you use? E minor, and there's many, many others. You know, if you're a little jazz hack, over a two chord, you can always play the five as well. So say if you're playing a two, five, one and say um, um, uh, D, so you can do E minor seven, A seven, D major seven over the E, play the B minor pentatonic, right? Because that isolates certain notes. You get the, bring, again, you bring out the ninth, you bring out some colorful notes. And over the five, what you can do is um, play over that one, instead of the B, play the C minor pentatonic over the A, a altered or A7. So that's a really cool one to play as well, because that way you get all the altered tones plus the flat seventh. This is a little more advanced for some of the more advanced players, or if anybody hung out here that long. Um, and then back over the one chord, over the D, you play um, a C sharp. So you got B, C, C sharp, B minor pentatonic over the E, over the A7, or A altered maybe. Right, because you get flat nine, sharp nine, flat five, sharp five, and flat seven. And if you play over the D, play a major, C major, C, C sharp major pentatonic, just down a semitone. So nice that sounds? C sharp minor over a D major, semitone off. It may seem weird, but if you, if you do the anal anal analysis, you do the application, you evaluate, and you synergize and create, you get good things. So I'm going to wrap up with all that uh, stuff I talked about earlier.
A quick, again, I apologize for rushing on certain things. Hope you got something out of this tonight. The handouts can be all available, so we can make those available for you guys if you want any of this stuff. Um, that's easy for me to do, and there was a lot more that I didn't get to. So thanks to my wife tonight for drive. I drive her crazy today with all these handouts that she prepared. Thank you very much. Matt, uh, sitting in the wings there, uh, helped us with our sound tonight, and thanks to Law McQuaid. Uh, huge thanks for putting these on. Um, I really, really appreciate that. Hope you learned something. To go to Anadaria, thanks so much. And to all of you, I think, I don't know how, you know, if there's anybody left, um, enjoy the rest of your St. Patrick's Day. Oh, wow. So there's a lot of people who hung in there. And again, please enjoy this journey of music and learning. If you're not having fun, then I don't know why we're doing this. I hope I enlightened you. I apologize for rushing and hacking my way through stuff. But again, I have lots of music. I have 10 albums out under um, Rob Tardic Music. Um, I have my whole diversity series. Um, I don't know if my hung can show those maybe quickly. Are those easy to get or no? Nope. The diversity albums? Yeah, like I have some albums here I can show off. Shameless self-plugging for myself. Just check out robtardic.com. You'll find me on Spotify. Every single streaming platform. You'll hear M&M's, the tune I played with the all the sweet picking I did there earlier on the B minor 11 arpeggios and different ones. Um, that tune M&M's is called Mixed Modes because I simply used so many modes. I used the Byzantine scale. I was using... Um, uh, I was doing Phrygian um, minor, Phrygian with a, a low grade and flat second from the melodic minor scale. I was using Lydian. I did the simple major scale, the Dorian. I don't want to go over them, but I did so many different scales I mixed into that song. So that's up there. So again, and then I have another uh, hard rock album I released a while back, Paradise Alley. That's just some shred guitar for people who enjoy that from the 80s. I re-released that last year during COVID. I found all the old masters on actual tape. Um, that me and my brother recorded a long time ago. So if you want to check out Paradise Alley, I never even promoted that album, so I don't think there's any, not too many people listening to it, but you can check that out. And my nine solo Rob Tardic albums, um, my best of series diversity, and then the six ones before that. So lots of music. You can check out my music, and hopefully you come see me live and uh, say hi at Law McQuaid in Oshawa. I'm usually teaching there. If you want to take some lessons, come and see me. I'm at uh, Oshawa Law McQuaid. I'd welcome to see some students who are in the Durham area because I'm out here in Whitby. Um, again, thanks to all the Lama Equations for broad broadcasting this nationally. Um, I hope you guys learned something, and I'm going on. Uh, is there any questions before I sign off, or we're good, and I can let these fine people enjoy their St. Patrick's Day night? Is there any questions um, before we go off on anything that I mentioned, or people are like, what the hell did this guy just go over? I'm like lost. You know, well, I hope I got some thank yous. Thank yous. I hope I got hate mail is too. You know, you can hate this stuff too. You can just, I hate this guy, this theory. <laughs> but it's not all about that. Remember, it's, you know, it's, it's just getting to know your fretboard is a lifelong journey. I'm still learning my fretboard. It's if you love guitar, you love the whole thing. You know, and for me, it's not just, I love playing songs and riffs and yes, and, but, and I love writing on my own. As an artist myself who performs, for a living as well and teaching, I perform my own music, so I, I love crafting songs and progressions. And that cycle of fifths is something I highly encourage you to really look into. Every chord progression from the Beatles to Metallica, you name it, the band, there's all been written. They're all in that cycle of fifths. They're all there, the chord progressions are there. They've been around. It's just pulling them out, learning about them, how to identify them, right? And discriminate the different patterns and, and hearing, ear training and uh, sight reading. That's a huge important thing as well. Um, for those who are interested in getting to higher levels of learning. But again, that's another conversation for another class. So um, thank you. I'm, I'm blasted. Was there any questions or no? We're going to sign off. Now I'm really going to sign off. Okay. We're good. We're signing off. Okay. Thanks, everyone. All the best. Let's amplify kindness throughout everything going on. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Long and the play where the music begins.